I just want to share with you some of the work we are doing at Sensible City Lab at, uh, at MIT. So we used to look at cities like this. What you see here is actually Gian Battista Nolli's map on Rome, 1747. Uh, and you see you know, the city described like a physical artifact. But today something interesting is happening is that we start to describe cities in a different way. Now we're talking about smart cities. What is smart cities? Well, it's a convergence of digital and physical. We can collect a lot of data from cities. As we see here, we can use the data to better understand what goes on. And then we finally, all this knowledge can help us, hopefully, design better cities. So I just want to share with you some examples of how we can use data, really, to better understand and design cities. Um, and incidentally, that's an old dream. This is Ildefonso Cerda, the father of modern Barcelona. Uh, over 100 years ago, he was dreaming about a day when actually, thanks to data, we would, uh, you know, the, the, he says, you know, the building of cities will become a genuine science. Well, that day has now arrived. For instance, today we can look at a city like this, like a living organism. Uh, that visualization done by Pedro Cruz, Pedro was a, a researcher at our lab, now a professor at Northeastern University, shows Lisbon map using mobility data. So like a living organism, we couldn't see a city like this a few years ago, we can see the city like this today. And then if we take the data we visualized a moment ago, we can discover interesting things. Uh, here is actually taxi data in New York. That's JFK Airport. Every dot is a pickup or a drop-off. You see here Manhattan and all of the boroughs. And then we can ask many questions. For instance, the first question we asked was, uh, if you look at those two points in Manhattan, you've got hundreds of thousands of trips connecting them in the course of the year. How many trips could be shared? Sometimes we say if you've got big data, you need uh, big math or new math, new mathematics. So here we, we use network science to try to address that question. Uh, here you see this kind of shareability network, you know, the methodology we use, the networks that you get to tell you how many trips could be shared. And the interesting thing is actually that in Manhattan you can take everybody to destination when they need to be there, give or take one, two, or three minutes. The small delta you got on the x-axis but uh, actually with 40% less vehicles than what we have today. Now, when we did the research, actually, uh, Uber had not launched Uber Pool yet. Uh, and uh, when the results were out, you know, a nice discussion started. The New York Times did a review and so on. And uh, Uber reached out. We started a collaboration between MIT and Uber. And as you might know today, Uber Pool allows exactly this. Allows people going more or less in the same direction to share a ride. And if you share a ride, it means one less car on the road. All other things being equal, that means less traffic, less energy consumption, less pollution in, in our cities. So that was just a simple example of how we can take the city, digitize it, look at the digital twin, look at all this kind of big data, and then analyze the big data to discover new dimensions of the city. With that, we can also discover other things. Um, in this problem, what we did was not look at sharing rides, same data as before, no sharing trips, but actually how can we do the best dispatching? Take Manhattan, what is the minimum fleet to keep Manhattan on the move? Here is a small video. So again, real... What you see here is actually the situation today. Um, and what you see in a moment, you see actually how it is today, but how we can do this better, how we can rethink the intelligence of dispatching, again, in order to satisfy the mobility demand of Manhattan, but with a lesser number of vehicles. And what you see here to the right is the situation today, to the left is actually how the situation could be. And if you extrapolate to the future, when we'll have probably more self-driving cars and more you know, mobility on demand, then potentially we could actually run Manhattan with 50% of the vehicles we, we have today. So again, you, know, you take the city, you, you, you turn it into data, and then you analyze the data. A couple of additional examples. You can also find uh, kind of more universal laws. This was a few months ago. It's, uh, uh, it's a recent paper where we use uh, other data, in this case, cell phone data that describe mobility in many countries, and we discovered something interesting. We called it the visitation law. Visitation is that 
In the past, we, we found, you know, in, in the literature, we got many laws that tell us if you go to a city and another city, how many people commute between one and the other. What we never were able to look at is how many people, what is the frequency that every person has in going from one city to, to another. And it turns out that actually the distance and the frequency are related. So what is important is not only one over distance power alpha, one or two is the exponent, which uh, was known before, but actually it's a combination of the two, is the distance and the frequency. Or in this paper from a few weeks ago, what we did was uh, something I noticed on myself when I was studying at Cambridge in the UK, that was following two paths going from the college to the department. One path in one direction, the other path in another one. And that was very puzzling at the time, and now with big data we actually realize that that's uh, quite common, we all do that. We looked at Boston and San Francisco, and it's very similar to what animals do, which is called vector-based navigation. Our brain doesn't follow the shortest path, but tries to minimize the angular deviation to, to the destination. So we try to point in the direction of, uh, of the destination. Well, there's just some example of how this space of big data, which is intimately related to, to smart cities, we'll discuss it in a moment all together, you know, can help us understand the city in a, in a different way, in a way we couldn't do a few years ago. And I want to share with, uh, with a final project, we looked at here at uh, mobility, mobility of cars, of people, but let's look also at mobility of things. And if you look at this, if you look at that computer that's on the table behind, uh, you know, today we know everything about that computer. Every chip in that computer, we know where it was produced, how it moved on the planet, how it became that machine. A few years from now, however, you, th you stop using that machine, and then you know very little about it. Sometimes this is what happens to a lot of the e-waste we generate. You know, it ends up somewhere, sometimes in the wrong place. So what we decided was, what if we could put a little tag on trash and start following trash? A little bit like what happens with nuclear medicine. You put a tracer in the blood of a person and you follow it through the body. How can we do the same thing at the scale of an entire city? So we had to engineer the little tags. It's like engineering a miniature cell phone. The battery has to last for a long time and information can be, you know, doesn't need to be that much information as on our smartphones just location and time. Uh, this is a paper if you're interested. Here is the first diplomat in Seattle. There's some music as well, some sound as well, but 500 people, 3,000 objects. We put a tag on all of them. Anything from banana peel to e-waste. And after tagging all of them, we started following them. So here you see 3,000 objects in uh, Seattle, the day of deployment. After a few days, you see emerging some of the main landfills next to Seattle. You see the triangle there, the south of Seattle. But an actual big surprise, how far start stuff started to travel. Sometimes in crazy, unpredictable ways. Look at a trace that went all the way to Chicago and then changed its mind and went back to California. You know, traveling for thousands of miles across the United States. And stuff still traveling, moving after one month or, or two months. So again, what we hope is this here, you know, by using data, we can really better understand, uh, in this case, call it not the, the supply chain, but the removal chain, what happens to waste, and hopefully be able to manage it better in our cities. Now, this was just a, a, a few things from the lab. I'll stop it here so we can have a conversation together. Thank you.